Once again, I am joined by Neil Trevitt. Neil, would you be so kind as to introduce yourself and what Kronos Group is and what are its goals? Sure. Hey, everyone. So uh, my name's Neil Trevitt. I, my, my day job is at NVIDIA, where I work with developers to help them get to the goodness of our silicon. But I'm also the elected president of the Kronos Group. And the Kronos Group is an open industry consortium. And our mission is to define uh, royalty-free uh, interoperability standards to enable developers to uh, reach down into uh, awesome silicon uh, acceleration. So the areas that we focus on are the kind of use cases that need uh, silicon acceleration. So 3D graphics being the most obvious and pertinent one today. But we also do things like parallel computation, vision processing, and uh, machine learning uh, acceleration as well. We're about 150 companies. That's a lot of companies. <laughs> And we're almost 20 years old this year, too, so we've been doing this a while. <laughs> yeah, quite a long time. Uh, very not uh, on topic, but it's kind of funny because I remember like back in the, the 90s, early 2000s, like messing around with OpenGL and all of this stuff. And it just yes. it doesn't feel like long ago that I was I was swearing with like OpenGL mini drivers and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, or it's creating new new generations of things for you to swear at. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, things are a lot better now than like I remember that the you know when you're young and you just do idiotic stuff. I remember the worst fail I think I had um, was that I had a Voodoo Two graphics card, and as you know, the maximum resolution was eight by six. So I was like, oh, hey, it lets me go higher than that in this game. I can't remember what it was, and so I chose like ten by like seven six eight. <laughs> And then it just like went blank screen and I didn't have the internet at the time. So I was like, no, how do you, where's the config files? And I spent like half an hour just like basically crying into my soup while I'm trying to figure out like where everything is. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's, anyway. seven, that's pretty radical. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, getting from my failures. Um, so recently Vulcan's turned to its fourth birthday, I believe it is. Is it fourth? Yes, so um, we uh, launched Vulcan 1.0 back in 2016, and uh, we've been on a pretty steady kind of heartbeat of, we aim for every 18 to 24 months uh, to bring out a new core spec, and so we're actually slightly ahead of schedule. Uh, um, now, in this, this month, we're in January 2020, uh, we've just released Vulcan 1.2. Yes, and it's launched with a lot of enhancements, but before we delve into those kind of uh, in depth, let's discuss kind of the ecosystem about Vulcan and how it's evolved since last time we spoke. Um, yes. So Vulcan, I guess, is now like a lot of the... Uh, a lot of the parts now are kind of a core, sorry, part of the Vulcan core. And we've also seen a plethora of games now which are utilizing Vulcan. On mobile, of course, we've seen a lot of games use that. Uh, Google Stadia as well is using it. And we've also got games such as Doom Eternal, Borderlands 3, Rage 2, and so on. So how, I guess, is the question, What? how has the conversation changed with developers? And what have has their feedback how has their feedback, excuse me, changed over the last, I guess, couple of years? Yeah, that's a good, great question. So, you know, the just to zoom out a little, the, the, the fundamental reason that we have Vulcan is, you, know, you mentioned OpenGL earlier. Now, OpenGL is 25 years old and um, does still does sterling work. And OpenGL is going to be here for another 25 years. You know, it's not going to disappear. But people wanting to get more direct, low-level, more explicit access to GPU um, uh, acceleration um, has created this new generation of, of APIs. Um, Vulkan isn't the only new generation. There's DirectX 12 from Microsoft, there's Metal from Apple, and both uh, are awesome APIs. But Vulkan is our, our claim to differentiation, our uniqueness is that we are the only new generation uh, API for 3D graphics that is open, not controlled by any one company, and is portable across multiple uh, platforms. Um, it's interesting the difference between OpenGL and uh, Vulkan. The you know, 
OpenGL was really a graphics API. It, it kind of separated you quite a lot from the actual hardware, where Vulkan is a GPU API. You know, if you understand uh, the GPU, you, know, you can have a lot more control over what happens in, in the hardware. And I think it's the combination of that low-level control together with the portability um, that enables an application developer to develop a, a Vulkan app and to have it run on many different platforms. Those two things come together, and it's creating significant positive Vulcan momentum in the industry. Uh, it's now shipping pretty well you know, everywhere. Um, even the consoles have started. The first console uh, to ship Vulcan is Nintendo Switch. Um, it's in embedded systems. It's in the cloud. It's on PCs. It's on mobile. You know, it's a core part of Android. Um, you mentioned Stadia you know, and uh, Stadia and other game gaming streaming services. Uh, like to run their games in the cloud on Linux. You know, so Vulkan is the only game in town uh, there. Yeah, so that, there's a lot of momentum. A lot of games are now uh, shipping. So it's the, when we first launched Vulkan, when you first launch anything at 1.0, you know, the question, the valid question is, you know, is it going to get adopted? You know, is it going to solve an industry need? And the answer, you know, um, four years later is definitely yes. And uh, now the interest in Vulkan is, you know, what new functionality are we bringing in? You know, what, what's it going to do my, to my applications? And you know, what's the roadmap going forward? Okay, so you mentioned about functionality. So that is a very nice segue into my next question, actually. So Vulkan 1.2, as I mentioned earlier, brings a lot of functionality into the core specification. Um, mm -hmm. So in your own words, <clears throat> excuse me, can you highlight a couple of the most more important features, such as VK Fence? Yeah. So, and before I go there, I mean, the process that we go through um, is one of ver listening very carefully to developers and enabling those developers first with extensions that delivers the functionality that they've been asking for. And that gives us a great kind of test bed. Um, so the extensions that are that prove themselves in uh, in the industry that get used by the developers, and and you know, do they work in solving the, the problems they were intended to uh, solve? They are the new functionality pieces that we regularly then build into a new core spec. So, you know, if if you've been um, tracking Vulkan and you know, looking at the uh, evolution of the set of extensions one to Vulkan 1.1, there'll be no new surprises for Vulkan 1.2. Now, you will have seen all this functionality before in extension form, um, but no, that's a, that's a feature, not a bug. Hmm. You know, it may not be like super exciting, ooh, new stuff, um, but you know, all the functionality that we're folding into 1.2 no, has, has been uh, proven in the Darwinian uh, process. And in the end, we've ended up with uh, 23 um, extensions uh, that have been shipping for a while on Vulcan 1.1. Now, they have passed that test, that bar, and now they're included into 1.2. And you can you can group uh, approximately, you know, it's, it's, it is approximate, but you can kind of group the new extensions into uh, into four main uh, groups. The the big one is the pain points from developers you know, using 1.1. 1 .1, uh, what what are the um, things that we can do to make developers more effective? That the key um, piece of functionality that was most requested was uh, timeline semaphores, which is a much more powerful way of synchronizing multiple threads. Um, and I can go into more detail on that if you're interested. The, the other- I, I the, will the actually other... ask more about that stuff later on. Uh, don't okay. worry, I've got sure. those questions. Yeah. <laughs> sure, sure. But no, at, at this high level, you know, the other big thing that, that is enabling for many um, developers is now you can use HLSL uh, as, uh, as well as GLSL. Now, uh, the direct 3D shading language now works on Vulkan, and we've put a lot in to 1.2 uh, to make that more effective. Um, and layering direct 3D over Vulkan uh, is a, kind of another big trend, and that we've put in functionality into 1.2 to, to streamline. Uh, there are some usability 
improvements. So you, know, you can um, find out what is the latest version of the CTS test your drivers are uh, passing, you know, just so you make sure you're up to date, things like that. And then last but not least, um, we have two, two basic missions with Vulkan. One is to make sure that the developers are happy and enabled um, to be productive. The other one is to push forward the um, the, the, the boundary of what uh, GPU hardware is capable of by adding uh, new GPU uh, hardware acceleration uh, features. But th this is a Vulkan 1.2. 1, 1 it's not a no, hypothetical 2.x. So we want to maintain uh, compatibility so that any GPU uh, that is shipping Vulkan 1.0 and 1.1 needs to be capable of also supporting Vulkan 1.2 because we want all of the Vulkan GPUs out there to be able to be have their uh, dri drivers updated and support 1.2. So, so how do we square that circle? You know, pushing forward GPU functionality, but not uh, disenfranchising any existing hardware. We have added quite a lot of new functionality, but it, it is optional uh, at this point. So we're not mandating anything that would uh, mean that no, an existing API wouldn't be uh, able to run 1.2. Over time, you know, we'll go through the same Darwinian process, which of those feature, optional features really get used, and you know, we would make them non-optional in some future version when the timing is right. Okay, awesome. Um, so looking at the roadmap, uh, this is on page seven of the uh, press release you provided me, just so that we're kind of keeping up if you're unfamiliar. Um, <clears throat> for roadmap discussions, which are, is going to be obviously for future versions, uh, mm -hmm. you're discussing machine learning, ray tracing, um, which obviously NVIDIA have been pushing ray tracing on Vulkan anyway. Uh, video mm -hmm. encoding, variable rate shaders, and mesh shaders. So starting out with the ray tracing side of things, what are your personal thoughts on the technology for gaming and professional? And how do you feel that it's going to evolve uh, evolve over the next couple of years in terms of improvements to uh, the performance? And in general, how do you feel it's going to be adopted in the industry? So... No, you're right. You know, NVIDIA has uh, kind of been leading the charge to bring uh, ray tracing into uh, the gaming uh, domain, you know, down from the professional uh, side of the, the industry. And um, I think the time is 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 now. I think the, the, there are enough titles shipping that the value uh, is proven. And you know, the time is right to bring... Uh, ray tracing capability into Vulkan. So it's no longer just an NVIDIA proprietary vendor extension to, to Vulkan. Uh, no, it's available to all of the GPU vendors that want to you know, add acceleration for ray tracing uh, in, into their GPUs. Um, and you know, the good news is that you know, we have been working on that for some time uh, in the Vulkan working group. We actually have a, you know, a subgroup inside uh, the Vulcan working group that has been working hard on creating a cross vendor uh, ray tracing uh, extension, and you know all of these roadmap um, discussion items. You know that we will follow the the same process. We will first release them as extensions, you know, and if the, the developer community likes them, uh, we'll we'll put it into a future core uh, spec. So I think you'll see um, quite strong continued adoption of ray tracing that a cross vendor Vulkan extension will help that momentum. Um, obviously there's you know, ray tracing is quite demanding on, on the hardware. So I think you know, the laws of physics will mean that it, it does start out as it has done on the higher end desktop hardware and it will go down to lower and lower desktop GPUs. Um, and then eventually it'll make the jump over into mobile, but you know that 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 will take longer. You no, know, simply because you know, there is an amount of um, processing load uh, entailed in doing high quality ray tracing. I mean, I think it's good that the consoles as well are adopting it, which should in theory spur the ecosystem on a little bit more. Um, yeah. Microsoft obviously have confirmed it, and PlayStation have confirmed uh, real time ray tracing. So yeah. hopefully that does push the technology because. I, I I do get some flack for this, um, but personally, I would rather play a game with like DLSS with a lower frame rate or what have you. Maybe because my eyes suck, I don't know. <laughs> but I think it looks visually better. Um, 
than not having ray tracing because I was messing around with control just in my own time, not for a video or anything. And mm -hmm. when you're disabling ray tracing and then re-enabling ray tracing on like control and a couple of other games, the difference is just, it's profound. Like just looking at the reflections when you're going through the offices in yes. uh, control and just obviously you can do cool stuff with screen, uh, screen space reflections and you can kind of like trick the person into thinking oh look this looks pretty you know this looks pretty accurate but compared to being able to see stuff that actually is off screen it's something you don't really think about in games because you've been so conditioned to not think about that stuff but yes. then when you actually see it and you see old oh, okay, someone's sneaking up behind me because I can see the reflection in, you know, some distant painting or something like that that happens to have a reflective surface. It makes such a difference in an immersion, in my opinion, anyway. Yes, no, absolutely. And I've, I've heard that, that that a lot is the um, the people that you know, have tried it out in their gameplay experience, you know, that they don't want to go back. It, it is a fundamental um, you know, step forward in the, in the technology. And not, not only does it make games more functional i like your example you know seeing someone sneaking up of you in a, in a reflection that's a great example um, it makes games more beautiful um, but also critically once the game developer community really embrace this it makes games easier to develop because you know you don't have to do all of the kind of the, the tricks uh, you can just use ray tracing it's much easier technology from the development point of view because you don't have to be you know, uh, faking everything you can just you know, do the real calculations that you need to do things you know, properly air, air, air quotes and uh, it actually re can reduce the de development load you know, whilst giving all these gameplay advantages so um, as the, the hardware community you know, uh, comes up and delivers a good level of acceleration I think you know there's no question in my mind that this is this is kind of the really the next big step for uh, graphics in general and gameplay particularly from what I understand as well given that obviously this when you're generating the rays it provides uh, uh, I guess the best way of describing it is a very accurate representation of the space around the character I've also been told that this is really good for AI that you can actually run AI using uh, ray tracing in theory mm-hmm yeah, I mean, the, that, that's a whole fascinating intersection, you know, the, uh, in the broader industry, you know, machine learning, neural networks and uh, AI is, is a huge uh, topic. And I think you're going to see, you know, continue to see machine learning uh, being used uh, uh, in the graphics domain um, for all kinds of things. You know, you mentioned, you know, DLSS, it's using AI to improve the back-end filtering and uh, display, uh, but also in the front-end of a, of a game engine too, you know, better um, AI for um, non-person uh, characters, the, the, you know, the routing, you know, all, all kinds of things in, in gameplay, you know, how your character runs up a hill realistically <laughs> uh, through, through modeling and um, you know, an AI-driven uh, animation model. Uh, yes, I, th I think games in you know, five, ten years that that use both ray tracing and machine learning are, are going to be unrecognizable you know, in many respects from the, the games that we've had today. I think you're spot on when you say that we've been conditioned to um, accept you know, faking it. <laughs> <laughs> Fake it until you kind of make yeah. it, I guess. <laughs> yeah, right, right. For, for, for a while and, you know, it's actually very exciting that we have the opportunity to break through some of those you know, uh, barriers into more realism, uh, both from the physical and the, the visual. Point I mean, of view. not that you can necessarily in, uh, endorse this, but it's been really interesting to see games um, that have been running on like emulators and people are injecting ray tracing into them, into them like uh, Zelda, uh, mm -hmm. on the Switch, and you're just like okay, that looks ridiculously good. <laughs> right. right, well, you know, and the ray tracing version of Minecraft, uh, the main ray tracing version of Doom, you know, it, 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 it who knew that you know, if you actually have real lighting and uh, calculated visuals using uh, much more uh, 
features of the actual you know, physical world you're trying to look at, you know, more light makes it more beautiful and more functional. Who knew? <laughs> I, it, I have to say, I'm a really big fan of RTX Quake 2, or Quake 2 RTX. I think it's ridiculously mm -hmm. cool. And it also um, brings back memories for me as well of my childhood, which probably helps a little bit. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. So switching anyway topics, because we could wax lyrically for a long time about ray tracing, um, mesh shape, uh, sorry, mesh and variable rate shading, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding on their functionality. Can you provide a simple explanation for the average individual and also a push to get developers excited as well? Sure. So uh, variable rate sh shading is... Um, uh, quite a well-proven technology now. We're bringing it in as uh, soon as a um, Vulkan extension. This is where you can control the number of rendered pixels uh, per an area of the dis display. And you would you know, um, typically do that you know, with a kind of a, um, a density image. So, so you, you know, put more um, brightness where you want more pixels to be, and this this would be um, it's not the only way of controlling it, but that's not what one way. The this is typically used to um, put more pixels where they're most needed, and you know, the 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 poster child uh, application for this is virtual uh, reality. But if you have a HMD with eye tracking, uh, you know where the uh, user is looking, and um, you can use variable rate shading to put more pixels you know, in the foveal area, you know, the center of the image where you know, the human eye has more visual acuity. Um, so you definitely appreciate more pixels you know, where you're uh, looking at, but your peripheral vision, your uh, the number of pixels you can discern quickly drops off on a curve. And so you can save significant amounts of uh, battery power uh, uh, or you know, increase your frame rate by not throwing lots of pixels into someone's um, peripheral uh, vision area where they're not going to see the detail uh, anyway. You can focus the processing power that you have you know, uh, at the spot where they're looking you know, to where it really makes makes a difference. So you know, as uh, virtual reality uh, displays continue to you know, up in resolution. Um, and this is going to be you know, a vital technology that's going to be used you know, in pretty well every VR system uh, in the near future, I think. Uh, mesh shaders is a whole uh, topic, um, but you know, in, in, in essence, the just like um, you know, uh, years ago, the, the big steps in the graphics pipeline um, came from making uh, the pipeline stage um, not fixed function, but programmable. Uh, uh, mesh shaders is basically bringing uh, the same kind of level of uh, flexibility to how you uh, generate and process uh, geometry, um, giving much more flexibility you know, than, the, than the current generation of uh, geometry and tessellation uh, shaders. And um, this is slightly further out. Um, uh, there's still a lot of discussion and uh, debate is the, the best way to do it. But but it's, it's getting closer. You know, it's getting close enough now that you know, we put it on the roadmap because there are uh, discussions underway and you know, we're getting closer to being able to ship uh, some extensions. Awesome. Um, <clears throat> so one of the things obviously that is kind of the purpose of Vulcan and you touched on it earlier is the ability to have a platform agnostic API. So there's a couple of parts to that. One, um, for us, for Linux gamers, uh, there are several thousand playable games now, uh, which run DirectX 11 or older, thanks to mm. DK, uh, DXVK, excuse me, and Wine. And there's also yes. been great portability initiatives on Apple, as well as other vendors. So I guess there's been a lot of movement here in particular um, same question as earlier, how are you finding the conversation is shifting with developers and how would you say the ecosystem is evolving because of this? It, it's really interesting that the uh, layering things over other things has become uh, a trend, a discernible uh, trend. We're finding that um, 
And it works both ways. Layering things on top of Vulcan and layering Vulcan on top of other things. <laughs> <laughs> a Vulcan uh, sandwich. <laughs> a Vulcan sandwich, exactly. So in terms of layering other things on top of Vulcan, and firstly, you know, Vulcan is a nice low-level API, so it's a, it's a great foundation for layering other things on, on top of. And of course, people are interested to layer um, things that uh, have content so that you know, they enable that content to flow and have more uh, deployment flexibility. Uh, there are a few uh, examples. Um, you know, OpenCL. You know, we have that's not on the graphics domain, but in the compute domain, uh, people are using OpenCL now being layered on top of Vulkan. So if they have a lot of OpenCL code, now they can deploy it in lots of other places. Um, but the the specific example you mentioned was running DX over Vulkan. So the um, this enables you to bring a whole bunch of DX content, uh, as you say, Direct 9, Direct 3D 9, 10, and 11 content uh, over onto, for example, Linux that has native uh, Vulkan drivers. Um, and Valve has have been doing a lot to, to drive this, as, as, as you're aware. The, uh, they've bundled up the Wine uh, compatibility layer. Now that brings Windows onto Linux. Uh, DXVK, which is an awesome layer of Direct3D 9 to 11 over Vulkan, and that Valve has wrapped it all up into their Proton tool, um, so which basically brings the Steam catalog um, you know, over onto Linux, and it lets people you know, try out the games and report the games that are working. And it is kind of stunning. Uh, six and a half thousand games have gone through that process and are now working on Linux um, through that combination of tools, um, so you know, it, it is it is pretty awesome. And it also means that, of course, the old stereos hype of, well, Linux is not a gaming OS is pretty much nuked as well, right? It, it, you can basically play not every game, but most games now run perfectly, and that's not including um, Vulkan native games, for example. Right. Right, as, exactly. I mean, an increasing number of games are being authored um, natively in in Vulkan, but yes, this layering and deployment flexibility uh, trend is, you know, as you say, you know, it's uh, bringing huge catalogs on, on onto Linux. And I think you know there are there are a number of interesting trends. We kind of mentioned it before. It's obviously the desktop gaming Linux community is key, uh, but also you know, people are increasingly interested to run things in the cloud and stream. Uh, the gaming experience, and for people running gaming streaming services, you know, Linux is a very att attractive OS for doing that. And so, you know, you're getting multiple um, avenues of momentum building behind uh, Linux gaming, which is which is good good to see. Exactly. I mean, as much as from a personal perspective, I don't really like game streaming yet. Uh, I think, mm -hmm. to be honest, I'm just that. I think I just kind of like the hardware in my home. It's not for technical limitations. I It's just a personal preference to me. Um, right. So I know that... Which is kind of weird, because I also am someone who's got Netflix. So it's kind of weird. <laughs> right. So I... I just just yeah. proves your own point. But yeah, exactly. I, 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 I'm... I really, I, so there's, there's there's been a lot of discussion, you know. Oh, you know, streaming is going to replace natively installed apps on your own hardware, or you know, or streaming is never going to happen. It's too 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 difficult. You know, the, the two extremes of that spectrum. Of course, the reality is in the middle. Uh, streaming is not for everyone, uh, but it it's another you no know, significant choice uh, for how people can choose to get their gaming experience. It'll definitely work for some folks. It won't work for others, and that's fine. You know, the, the, the two native uh, installed games and straight game streaming, you know, they both will be uh, healthy and existing going forward. End-user choice is a good thing. The irony, well, not ironic, but it is also interesting because of the game streaming services. Obviously, if you're a developer, you're going to want to create a title, unless it's an exclusive to like the Xbox or whatever, you're going to want to make your title playable in as many systems as possible and obviously game streaming is going to be one of those so if most of the OS's are going to be Linux the gamers who are PC are going to directly benefit anyway because theoretically there should be more Linux ports of games, at least theoretically Sure Yeah, that's good. Uh, diversity and, and choice is, is good uh, for everyone in the gaming industry, I agree. 
So, switching topics, I remember one of the first times we've spoken, actually. Um, it was just when the Ryzen processors were coming out. So we were getting more processor cores, and obviously that was good. But games then, well, if you had a 6700K, you were probably good, to be honest. Um, but now software and games are starting to evolve. Adobe, for example, have also changed the way that um, Premiere works. It's starting to take advantage of many more processor cores, which is obviously good. Um, mm -hmm. And consoles, one of the big upgrades is they're using Zen. Uh, both Sony and Microsoft have confirmed it's going to be Zen 2 based with eight processor cores, uh, which yeah. is obviously good because the CPUs in the other machines, putting it kindly, they were not ideal. <laughs> um, so I guess now the CPUs from the previous generation were the weakest part. So how do you think games are going to evolve now that they have so much more access to CPU performance and how is that going to, uh, I guess, change the way that developers are developing games, but also what we can expect to see and also kind of how this will benefit Vulkan and kind of the ecosystem? Yeah, that's a, that's a good, good question. In fact, I think it's the other way around. I think Vulcan benefits the folks trying to uh, tap into the potential of multi-core uh, CPUs and just general multi-threading uh, in general, not just on the on the host uh, system, but also you know, making uh, better use of your your GPU capabilities. Because if you remember, I think one of the last times we talked about the, tra the transition from OpenGL to Vulkan. You know, um, OpenGL was you know, bringing a lot of advanced capabilities, you know, like bindless graphics, uh, et cetera. But in the end, the one thing that was so fundamental to the design of OpenGL that we couldn't fix it without basically you know, um, needing it to be something else was the command dispatch into OpenGL was single threaded. And that was you know, the biggest single breakthrough as we went into the Vulcan uh, generation. Uh, as you remember, you know, Vulcan has uh, multiple um, command queues for um, compute, as well as rendering and uh, data movement. Um, and you can, using the Vulcan way of working, you can construct um, using as many cores as you are able to program. Uh, you can construct command uh, buffers and feed them down through the multiple queues in, into Vulkan with so much more flexibility than it was possible with, with, with OpenGL. So Vulkan eliminates that single bottleneck. And I think you know, the game developer community is now making good progress to figure out, OK, given this level of freedom that we are now uh, uh, able to exploit, what can, what can we do with it? And you're seeing much more complex models, more complex uh, physics. Um, anywhere that you can apply the power of these you know, amazing multi-core CPUs, you know, it's beginning to hit uh, shipping titles. The, 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 the key you know, challenge, as with any multi-threaded system, is you know, at effectively programming the multi-threading and make sure you know, everything is pr properly synchronized. That's, you know, that's non-trivial uh, programming. And I think you know, the industry in general is, is learning better techniques and getting better tools to enable that multi-threaded pro multi programming to you know, be done effectively. And that actually does bring me to um, what we were mentioning almost at the beginning of this, actually. Uh, some of the new features in Vulkan, such as VK Fens, VK uh, Semaphore, and so on. So I'm going to leave it to you now to kind of go in a little bit deeper onto some of this and how it's going to uh, improve the performance of Vulkan. So you can get a little technical here because I realized that I actually do have quite a lot of developers and uh, 3D artists who watch this channel. So yeah. Sure. So I think yeah. uh, it's kind of your time to sing and uh, push Vulkan. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do the best I can. I'm, yeah, but um, the the key thing that we've brought into Vulcan 1.2, but by um, strong developer demand, is uh, the new timeline semaphore. Um, because you know, as we were just talking, um, you have now in a in a modern Vulcan game, you have uh, multiple CPU threads, you have multiple 
GPU threads, and they're all going in parallel. And to make sure that these threads don't trip over each other, you need to synchronize how they access resources. You know, the most classic example, you know, one thread mustn't use a resource before it's actually being built by another thread that's actually making it. Um, so Vulkan provides uh, um, uh, synchronization primitives. Before Vulkan 1.2, there were actually two primitives, VK fence and VK semaphore. And you would use one for synchronizing host threads, uh, and you would use another one for synchronizing between the, the different GPU uh, operations. And e each of those primitives was essentially a binary state is one bit of information that a thread can signal and wait on. And you would use that to, you know, different threads would signal each other and wait on each other you know, under the, the control of the uh, application programmer. Because each of those um, um, semaphores was a single bit of information, you ended up needing you know, dozens or even hundreds of these sem semaphores you know, if you have a really complex set of um, parallel operations. And the feedback from the developer community was, this is getting very complicated and uh, the, the synchronization primitives are not that easy to use, not that, not that intuitive. So we now have timeline semaphore, uh, which brings to a number of you know, key advantages. One is that you don't need a different primitive for host and GPU synchronization, timeline semaphore will will meet all of your synchronization needs, you know, regardless of where they are. But from the from the the, the the deeper point of view, the key difference now is that it's not just a single bit of information; it's a 64-bit monoton monotonically increasing value in the semaphore. So for the threads can signal a value into that semaphore and can wait on that semaphore. Know, reaching a certain value, this this enables um, the the application developer really to create their own little um, uh, protocol, their own well timeline. That's why we call it the timeline semaphore. They can create their own timeline of what are the different values in in this semaphore. What do they mean? So, um, you know, yes, yeah, an arbitrary value one twenty means such and such in, in my application and suddenly you have uh, a lot deeper and more flexible um, synchronization possible through you know, a single uh, timeline semaphore which and again you know, go go back to what we were saying before we we know this works because it's been out as an extension and we're getting you know, very positive uh, developer feedback that this really does help in a significant way and uh, so now we're, we're building it in, into core and and to help the developers make the transition, because of course not everyone is going to get Vulkan 1.2 drivers right away, uh, we've put a, an implementation of the timeline semaphore out in open source uh, that layers over Vulkan 1.1. So um, the people, even if they're deploying to platforms that currently today have Vulkan 1.1, now they can you know, uh, begin to use the timeline semaphore um, right away. Okay, awesome. Um, also, I'd like to touch a little bit more on HLSL, if I may. Sure. Um, because you were discussing how that has been quite a uh, popular feature with uh, developers. And yes. I'm you know, having a look over your documentation here, and it states that Google have been quite big on this as well, pushing that heavily. Uh, so it's yes. So, could you explain a little bit how this technology works and what its benefits are? Sure. Yeah. So, the a lot of developers really like uh, HLSL, and and you know, just the, the context, GLSL has been the long time shading language for OpenGL. So it stands for you know, GL shading language. Direct3D uh, has its own shading language uh, called HLSL, um, and you know. People like uh, their own, it's a personal preference as to what pe people like. Um, HLSL has become very popular, particularly amongst the uh, AAA game developers that n need to deploy on Xbox uh, and they're using Direct3D and, and maybe they're using it on a PC. Um, no, HLSL has, no, is the, their shading language uh, of choice. 
before, if you wanted to, no, before this HLSL in Vulcan appeared, if you wanted, for example, to port your um, HLSL shaders onto a OpenGL, no, for Linux, it meant you had to translate all of your shaders from HLSL to GLSL, and that was a real pain, because increasingly, you know, all of the real interesting, uh, detailed graphics rendering and processing is not done in the API calls, it's done in the, the shaders. Uh, the shaders are really where the action is, and so having to do you know, a translation from one language to the other you know, was error-prone and time-consuming. So, the that's the situation now is much better. And the primary kudos actually goes to Microsoft, who back in 2017 uh, took the uh, awesome step of putting their production HLSL compiler that, that they use in their own systems out into open source. Um, and uh, that enabled the Vulkan community, you know, primarily being led by Google, uh, to, to pitch in. And you know, with the full cooperation and assistance from Microsoft, we've now added a Spear V backend into uh, this Microsoft uh, compiler, which is called DXC, you know, DirectX compiler. Um, so now, uh, when you write an HLSL program, it will go through the standard Microsoft front end. So all of the um, front end behaviors that you're you know, familiar with. Uh, from the standard Microsoft compiler, st still applying, nothing's changed. But the code that's generated is uh, Spear V intermediate representation, uh, as opposed to the normal DirectX intermediate language uh, code, with DXIL code. So once you have Spear V version of the backend code, you can feed that into your into your Vulkan uh, out application and, and runtime, and it it'll just It'll all just work, and the um, the level of uh, stability on uh, this Spear V backend in DXC has now reached the level where no, it, it really does work, and it's being used in um, multiple AAA shipping uh, titles. Uh, everything that's in HLSL is supported. Uh, Shader model 6.2 is the level that we're currently supporting, um, and we're now now Vulkan 1.2 is released. No, we're, we're busy adding uh, support for the 1.2 uh, extensions. Uh, NVIDIA has been contributing to this project too. For example, we mentioned the, the VK Ray uh, NVIDIA proprietary extension for Vulcan Ray Tracing. Uh, we've put support for that into uh, DXC. You know, obviously, the new extensions for Ray Tracing will, will be supported in H HLSL uh, as well. So it's a real community uh, effort and I think you know this is a significant advantage and uh, benefit to the game developer community um, so you know, it's really good really good to see it being used and then and the last point is um, as I mentioned before uh, quite a large block of the new extensions in Vulcan 1.2 are to support HLSL and you know, the, 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 the layered DirectX over uh, Vulcan ports. So you know, uh, we're busy making sure that HLSL is truly a first-class shading language um, alongside GLSL. HLSL is not going to replace GLSL. GLSL will, will continue, obviously. Uh, but again, uh, developer choice is good. So now developers have the genuine choice between GLSL or HLSL as they use uh, Vulkan. I'm going to ask something that I know other people will ask in the comments, um, and I mm -hmm. want you to answer it in your own words so that I'm not left with a whole bunch of the same question in the comments. Sure. Could you explain why Microsoft chose to open source this technology, HSL, HLSL, excuse me? I, I, well, I, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't want to put words into Microsoft's mouth, but I, I can tell... I can I can say what the result has been. I think you know it, it's really made HLSL uh, uh, a more widely used shading language uh, that you no know, is is the preferred shading language for for many of the developers out there. So I think it's definitely helped um, you know, build the momentum uh, behind a HLSL, um, which which I think is you know, good for everyone, including Microsoft. So I really uh, again want to. Thank and congratulate Microsoft for you know, in engaging with the with the community like this. I think it's good for everyone. I think what 
a lot of people have misconceptions with, especially if like you're someone who just kind of looks at things in kind of a console war like, if that makes any sense. You know, like PlayStation's best, no Xbox is best. Um, mm -hmm. I think a lot of people forget that ultimately Microsoft, excuse me, there's an amber that's going past my house. <laughs> Um, so I think a lot of people forget that Microsoft have a very different approach in many ways. That Microsoft, I'm obviously I'm I'm now the one putting words in their mouth, but um, I think Microsoft are much more interested in building an ecosystem uh, mm. compared to a closed platform, and that's obviously why we're getting games like Halo, for example, releasing on PC, or even why they've been pushing games out on the Nintendo Switch, and people are like, why are you doing that? Why are you releasing Ori on the Switch? And I think it's because Microsoft realized that the future is, as you said earlier, um, a lot more open, and yeah. they just want to have developers kind of in their ecosystem, rather than risk kind of everyone bolting and going to something else yeah yeah you know, I, I i think the um over the last few years microsoft has taken you know, lo lots of uh, and again i have no insider knowledge i'm just observing um you know, microsoft has taken lots of uh, initiatives in the uh open uh ecosystems i mean vulcan you know, and with hlsl here um is not the only one i mean the other big thing that uh Microsoft have been instrumental in driving forward is now GLTF. Uh, they've been a leader in the GL GLTF community uh, for you know, uh, several years now. Uh, they are the ones that are first shipping OpenXR on HoloLens 2. You know, they they are really, um, in many cases, taking a lead leadership role in adopting and driving uh, open standards. And I think it's great. And I think it benefits everyone again, and including Microsoft. Um, you mentioned one of going back to actually one of your first uh, points. You mentioned that the Nintendo Switch has been pushing Vulcan as well. Um, mm -hmm. I'm assuming games like we've seen ports, for example, of Wolfenstein on the Switch. I'm assuming that would be one of the titles that would be leveraging Vulcan. Yes, typically. I mean, the I think you can look at um, the titles on Nintendo. Uh, you can bin them into two. That there's the um, you know, the custom titles that typically you know, generated by uh, Nintendo, um, and they would you know, normally use the the native uh, API. But but if you're bringing an existing title over from uh, another uh, uh, platform, you know, it being able to use you know, the, the portable API can save you a lot of porting work. And to be fair, it's amazing how well Doom 2016. Wolfenstein and actually quite a few games run on the Switch given yeah. that the hardware inside of it is so it's basically a potato at this point I mean not <laughs> not hating on the Switch I mean it's an amazing console I own one myself and I love the machine but the hardware is basically based on I think a second generation Tegra um, and obviously the, the specs were cut down even then and it, you've got cell phones now which are more powerful than the Switch but obviously, it's you know the, they have the benefit of a uh, closed um, you know development environment, so you kind of can squeeze every last drop out of the orange, if you if you will. But right. it's really right. impressive what they can actually get out of it, and it's it's kind of a testament to just how Vulcan is so scalable. Because I think most people would agree that when you first saw the Switch you would be like, there's no way that Doom is going to run on this thing. It's just not. It, right. it almost feels like it doesn't have a right to run on the console. Right. Yeah, no, you're right. No, the, it's, the developers are you know, skilled at bringing out the best in any, any platform. The ticker is kind of ahead of its time. To, <laughs> to, I mean, because because it's based on the same architecture as the you know, NVIDIA desktop GPUs, you know, it's, it has that kind of... Um, uh, heritage and kind of um, depth uh, of architecture that, that makes it well suited to to running Vulcan. Um, however, uh, I just want a few last questions before we wrap up because I know your time's quite limited. Um, so I just have a couple more questions. It's sure. been mm, just under a year, I believe, since we'd last spoken. I think we last spoke on uh, 1.1 release, mm -hmm. if memory serves. Um, so 
I would like you to give a couple of examples of think, things you think Kronos, not just Vulcan, it can be for anything, you, you, you know, Spear, Vulcan, whatever, WebGL, uh, things you think you've done very well over the last few months, but also things that you feel that you need to improve after feedback from the community. So uh, that's a great question. The um, I think one of the things that is a success story for Kronos that m many people may not realize is Spear, Spear V. Um, you know, Vulcan gets all the limelight, um, but behind the scenes, you know, Spear V is the thing that's enabling this innovation and flexibility in the language and compiler stacks. And you know, as we mentioned, you know, increasingly, of course, you know, all the all the action is where the shaders are and you know, the flexibility we were just discussing about bringing HLSL over onto Vulkan, that is only possible because we have Spear V and running open CLC kernels on Vulkan runtimes, that's only possible because of Spear V and bringing Vulkan onto uh, Apple platforms as a layer on top of the native metal drivers that is only possible because of Spear V. So Spear V is the hero uh, behind the scenes as we you know, really dive into um, making uh, shading languages more portable and more powerful. Um, so you know, shout out to uh, to Spear V. Um, uh, other other things that people may not have come across, but I think are are, are success. Um, shout out to GLTF. You know, um, a lot of the game uh, developer community are beginning to realize that GLTF can be a really useful part of their development pipeline and deployment strategy. You know, we'd like to say GLTF is like the uh, JPEG for 3D. It's not trying to be an authoring interchange format, but you know, if you need to have you know, quite sophisticated uh, 3D assets um, that are compact and easy to process um, and increasingly being natively supported by hundreds of tools, um, both import and export, no, then no, if you haven't checked out GLTF already, no, I would definitely uh, recommend uh, you going to take a look. Um, and then perhaps on the positive column, the last one, you know, the shout out to OpenXR. Uh, it, it's just about to break out in terms of the number of uh, XR HMDs uh, that support it. You know, we, um, we got the um, version 1.0 of the spec out uh, at SIGGRAPH, so just a few months ago. Uh, the conformance tests are almost complete. Um, the first beta um, versions are shipping. You know, HoloLens 2 is the first. Um, Oculus has uh, implementation in their dev channel. Uh, it's coming to you know, the, the Valve hardware soon. Um, so no, this year, 2020, appropriately, <laughs> um, you have to get in our 2020 pun. <laughs> 2020 uh, so, vision, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. God, your puns are but, as bad as mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, sorry. Um, uh, yeah. Yes, no, to, to 2020 is going to be the year, I think, that Open OpenXR breaks out and, and the, you know, the promise of being able to write portable um, uh, augmented reality and virtual reality applications you know, is going to be um, is going to be uh, realized so that that that's a real um, step forward for the industry because the VR industry in many respects I like to say it's, it's still in the VTA, v, VHS versus Betamax phase now if you asking someone to plonk down hundreds of dollars for their VR hardware you know, they, they literally have to say well are the do the applications that I want run on my hardware um, you know that's that's not a good position for anyone. Um, that level of consumer uncertainty, and I think OpenXR can definitely help um, solve solve that particular problem. Hopefully, as well, with um, Half Life Alex come out, it comes out. Excuse me, it might spur um, the adoption of VR as well. If it's a really killer app, um, mm -hmm. because we can argue that Half Life Two is the thing that pushed um, Steam. So sure. maybe this is going to be the thing that pushes VR. Not that VR is, you know not loved or anything like that but i think it needs a couple of apps which people just are really hungry for yeah i think so i think you've had some breakouts like you know the beat saber and others the 
but but I think the um, I think VR in general is doing better than people realize, and it hasn't lived up to the hype. Uh, but the hype was the problem, not the actual VR. Um, now, and it's it's getting steady adoption. It, it, you know, there's lots of applications for VR in the, kind of the enterprise space, you know, training uh, and uh, simulation and other um, uh, application areas, as well as you know, the consumer-based gaming. If you take it all as a whole, you know, VR is you know, steadily growing. It's not a hockey stick to you know, billions and billions of dollars, but you know, it is steadily growing, and that, that will just continue. And I think OpenXR you know, will just be one, one more contributing factor to the ongoing ongoing success okay so final two questions um in your opinion what would you say the limitations in graphics technology are still um that a lot of people are still finding in terms of uh, development so for example do you think that we're still bandwidth constrained for example pcie uh mem- do you think we're not got enough memory on graphics cards uh, CPUs, for example, do you think we still don't have fast enough processors, or do you think it's more software related? I'm going to leave this question totally down to you. <laughs> <laughs> I think the answer is yes to all of those, because I mean that's the wonderful thing about 3D graphics. And this, you know, many of us have been working in this field for many years. We're nowhere near. The, any endpoint where we're good enough. No, um, we are so far away from being able to generate completely convincing visual uh, reality. Um, no, I, I probably, you know, I won't see it in my lifetime probably, you know, and it'll continue you know, for, for many years. And it's awesome. It's awesome to be part of that kind of longer sweep of trying to make this uh, a possibility. Um, so on that path, you know, we will encounter all kinds of bottlenecks, and everything you mentioned is a bottleneck. You know, um, so you know, we we need that's a, again the wonderful thing about 3D. It kind of drives everything to its limit and helps push things forward. I think if you want to take a more a kind of next couple of years, I think the um, you now we we spent some time talking about ray tracing. The um, I think the people are going to find you know. It's going to take some time to find the right balance between uh, how we mix ray tracing in with the traditional ways of doing rendering whilst uh, we're still building up the amount of ray tracing acceleration that we have. You know, it's it's a common misperception that, that, that now we have ray tracing hardware. Okay, great. Now we can just use ray tracing for everything. Now, <laughs> if you try to do that, of course, it, it, it doesn't work. We don't have the horsepower yet to just take you know every scene, no matter how complex, and just throw it through a ray tracing engine and you get you know, 120 hertz at 4K. That doesn't work yet. Um, you can ray trace the entire level, even if you can't see it. We're not there yet, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. So, you know, the, the the ray tracing acceleration we have is so enabling, and you know, we were saying before, it, it really makes a difference. But you know, it's not enough to do everything yet. So we still have you know, a long uh, learning curve on how we best blend ray tracing acceleration with more traditional graphics acceleration. And I don't think one will... No, ray tracing will replace everything by any means. It's going to be a more and more intimate and um, nuanced blend of ray tracing and how it impacts and re- gradually begins to replace some of the um, uh, traditional rendering techniques as the power of ray tracing hardware continues to to grow. That That is a very interesting and um, uh, fascinating area to see how that evolves over the next few years. I also... I'm also very curious to see how the SSDs in the next generation of consoles, and obviously PCs are benefiting as well with SSDs no longer costing, you know, your, uh, you know, your left lung to pay for, you know, a reasonably mm-hmm. sized SSD. And I think because obviously consoles at the moment have really slow mechanical drives, like 5400 RPM or whatever it is, um, obviously getting data into RAM, I.O., and we've discussed I.O. a couple of times now, but I.O. is kind of like... A lot of people seem to associate it with just loading times are shorter, but it's not, because if you can stream data so much quicker into RAM 
uh, video RAM or main system RAM, and you can build these open worlds where you could teleport from like you know Earth to the Moon to you know to mm -hmm. Mars and just do all of the stuff. Or one example I use just because I'm a fan of the character, uh, so biased. But, um, imagine, for example, you're playing a Superman, and then you could travel at ludicrous speeds, and obviously the the data can be streamed at rapid, you know, thousands of megabytes per second. So you could have yes. textures which are profound you know profoundly large like 16k textures or what have you and because obviously you've got this vast amount of cpu performance but also next generation ray tracing technology it it, it it's really tantalizing to imagine the physics and the and just the assets that could be generated in the next five years time it's going to be fascinating if we were to talk in even two years to see what developers end up, you know, the creating just because of this of, of the technology that's going to be emerging over the next few years. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, yes. I mean, the, the two ingredients you need on for any computing problem, right, are processing power and storage. And you know, we, we, the Vulcan, um, you know, that's a lot for the processing power, but getting the um, storage hierarchy and you know, graphics applications with a tiered hierarchical storage um, model. No, so not everything is always going to fit into RAM. So what are you going to do? Uh, SSDs, no, they definitely help there. And I think the no, one interesting kind of this example of how important I.O. is to graphics in general, not just gaming, but you know, up in the high performance computing space, you know, building supercomputers, the most demanding uh, no, platform. You know, it's it's not a coincidence that NVIDIA has just spent you know, a lot of money you know, uh, uh, acquiring Mellanox, which is not a graphics company, it's a networking company, because I.O. is the bottleneck for many types of applications. And you, know, you can't, Amdahl's law, you can't just focus on, or you no, know, um, um, you have to focus on the bottlenecks that are actually causing the slowdown. And for many cases, no, it is I.O., not, not, not the processing power. So, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see um, I.O. You know, evolve along with you know, the GPU inner hardware to just render those pixels faster. You need to get them in and out faster, too. <laughs> I was actually, uh, it was, this is actually a question that I hadn't originally intended to ask, but I'll quickly mention it anyway. You've been doing a lot in terms, um, that is Kronos, just to clarify, though, I guess you could answer from video as well, but you've been pushing a lot um, with Kronos on professional level applications recently. Mm -hmm. So high performance computing, um, obviously professional level applications like Adobe Suite and so on and so on. Would you say that the industry is moving really fast at the moment? I mean, compared to, let's say, five years ago? Yes, I think the... All the kind of trends that we've kind of t touched on um, are all helping the um, and reliant on the the tools and the authoring applications. I mean, but things like um, AI, machine learning, are you know, impacting a lot of these uh, authoring processes. You know, um, good interoperable file formats like GLTF are, are helping. Um, and you know, just to bring it back to the main topic, Vulkan is now beginning to really impact you know, the professional graphics applications uh, in the space because of course you know the game developer community have a very different kind of uh, life um, lifetime uh, evolution for their applications you know, games you know, can largely you know, re-engineer things on each generation of games where a large cad or, uh, or authoring application you know, maintains an evolving code base over many, many years. So it's a different development model. So a lot of OpenGL professional applications uh, out there are you know, uh, figuring out right now, you know, should they and how can they uh, it transition to, to Vulkan? We're, we're finding that the um, the benefits of moving to Vulcan are beginning to to mount up uh, in a good way. So it's becoming increasingly you know, attractive for um, the professional applications. You know, the, the reduced CPU bottlenecks and multi-threading that we talked about, uh, the parallel compute and graphics and data movement inside Vulcan is very attractive. Uh, for example, if you're developing a video editing app, that is a perfect example of I.O. 
and data movement being the bottleneck, not necessarily the, the pixel processing. Um, so people are, are looking how to move over onto to Vulkan. The CAD community has been bottlenecked because we didn't have OpenGL style lines. That's now been solved. Vulkan has full OpenGL style lines as an extension. So we, we've enabled the CAD community to begin using Vulkan there. But these large um, code databases, they're not going to suddenly tra be transformed from OpenGL to Vulkan. This is going to be very often a multi-year effort. And so the Vulkan OpenGL interop is key. So now we can have Vulkan and OpenGL sharing resources and synchronizing. So that gives the opportunity for you know, a lar an example you know, we are allowed to talk about here is you know, uh, Dasso Gatia, one of the you know, leading CAD uh, programs has been an OpenGL application for many, many years. And now it's in incrementally moving over to Vulkan. The first thing that they've tapped into Vulkan for is, you know, is the ray tracing. It's unlikely to come to OpenGL, uh, uh, be retrofitted. So that kind of forward looking functionality you know, is going to be deployed in Vulkan. But now you know, an application like Katia can, from their OpenGL, reach over into uh, Vulkan for that new generation of functionality and you know they don't have to re-engineer the, the whole app in one go which is you no know, very enabling for them okay i'm going to ask you one final question because mm -hmm. i know that a lot of people who watch this channel um are starting out in graphics technology they're pursuing a career so mm -hmm. they may be considering going to school or maybe they've just finished their studies and starting out in the workplace and obviously you're fairly accomplished, to put it mildly. If you could give them a couple of pieces of advice to kind of, I guess, uh, arm uh, the next generation, what would you suggest? For graphics, you mean? If they were if looking for being a graphics developer? Graphics development, or um, just in general, kind of getting into the industry. So just a couple of pieces of advice from your perspective, other than obviously that they should learn Vulcan. <laughs> 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 that's actually it's in question you, you, I, we get that asked that question a lot you know I'm just starting in graphics should I learn OpenGL and, or should I use uh, should I learn Vulkan um, I think the um, the answer is maybe maybe both the I think the most of the new applications and you know, job opportunities I think in the graphics domain are increasingly using the newer generation APIs. And I think that that trend will continue. So, you know, I think if you're looking to you know, be at the cutting edge of um, graphics developments, I think you need to be armed with you know, knowledge, working knowledge of one of the new generation APIs and you know, Vulkan DX12 Metal, um, because that's almost certainly the API that probably you're going to be getting asked to, to use um, but on on the path to learning graphics is like like we were saying before uh, Vulkan is is not a graphics API it's a GPU API um, so if you if you you need to have the base understanding on you know, what is graphics you know um, what is a polygon you know all the normal things what is a texture how does it how does it get processed um, and OpenGL, which is a graphics API, you know, it's an encapsulation of the concepts of uh, the graphics pipeline, you know, can be a good way and uh, one of the best ways to learn those graphics concepts. And once you have those concepts, the Vulkan is the new modern way on how you uh, drive a GPU piece of hardware to make it do those graphics operations. So you, you kind of need both, but you know, if if I were starting out in college today, you know, I would I would make sure that you know, one of the new generation APIs was on on the on the syllabus. I think that's uh, going to be where you know, the rubber really hits the road when you come to actually you know, um, uh, creating new applications. Okay, and I think uh, given I've just eaten up over an hour and something of your time, that is pretty much a, a good place to call it. But it's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you. Um, is there any uh, final words you'd like to suggest? Like anything, any resources that you'd like uh, developers to check out or um, anything that you'd like to make people aware of? Well, I'd just like to thank you too 
I mean, it's been a real pleasure. I I, I love these chats. You make me think, and <laughs> hopefully I re- remain coherent throughout the hour. <laughs> well, I have to say that my the first, I'm going to be very honest with you, you were one of the first people I actually interviewed, so I was like, I was pretty nervous the very first time I, I spoke to you guys, um, the first interview. And I think it's kind of like... Um, Obviously, now that I've kind of got some more interviews under my belt, I feel less nervous, so I can kind of be less, like, nah, what do I say without sounding stupid? That's <laughs> <laughs> no, great. I, th- I think, you know, what, what you do here uh, with this kind of conversation, I think it, it definitely gives you, you know, a different perspective than you would normally pick up from you know, reading articles and you know, other kinds. So, yeah, I, I, I love doing these. So. Uh, I hope we can do a lot more. Yeah, definitely. Um, I would like to, and... sorry, in the future, I'd actually like to discuss slightly different topics. And um, it would be really nice, actually, to discuss um, things such as artificial intelligence, physics, uh, obviously in mm-hmm. games, and 3D creation as well. Because one of the things I'd like to do on the channel is, uh, and the website is to try and build, I, I guess, a bridge between developers and... Um, community and also kind of to explain things because I think that there's a fundamental um, you know you get people who are very hardcore into stuff and obviously they don't need to be told what you know a, a thread is for example or how a CPU works or you know any of that stuff but I think it's also good to have kind of these communications and be able to kind of build a rapport with people because I think it's really bad when companies kind of are almost this mysterious entity and people just see NVIDIA or Intel or AMD or ARM or whomever as kind of just that logo rather than actually mm-hmm. understanding that a lot of the companies they work together towards a common good kind of things like the classic example I always give is despite the fact that Xbox got its butt handed to them by PlayStation Phil Spencer still went on Twitter and actually congratulated PlayStation for fantastic games and I suspect that PlayStation are going to do the same when, you know, Xbox launch and so on. It's, it, I think sure. it's really good to kind of push that side of things. Yeah, ab- absolutely. And, and particularly coming from the Kronos side where, you know, every com- every industry needs competition. It's what drives things forward. But also every industry needs a safe space where companies can come and cooperate because through cooperation, you, know, you can remove a lot of the friction and the barriers that uh, prevents you know, the industry growing for for everyone's benefit. So, you know, competition and cooperation, you know, the yin and the yang, it's definitely good to have both. I agree. Um, so I think that's a good place to call it the interview. And I'd like to thank you one last time for um, organising, or agreeing to it anyway. Uh, Alex gets the... Uh, Alex gets the kudos for the organising and uh, dealing yeah. with both of our schedules. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so, no, f- but uh, so thank you too, Paul. This has been this has been great. Uh, I, I, again, I, I really enjoy doing these. Yeah, I do as well. So hopefully we can do it again, and uh, maybe next time as well we can touch on other aspects. I would, as I said, I'd really like to start talking about other things like. Uh, physics and so on i just realized that you know with vulcan that's come out we kind of needed to speak a lot about you know the 1.2 specification but i i think it's just fun to kind of discuss things in general anyway yeah yeah excellent all right right, thank you very much i'm gonna let you go but um take care of yourself and uh, thank you very much Mm